Welcome to our webinar on change management, the three perspectives. I'm Perry Kincaid and will be the host for today's webinar. Learning is defined by psychology as a relatively permanent change in behavior, itself triggered by change, real or anticipated. Appreci appreciate learning is not unique to people. It applies as well to organizations, communities, and in fact, entire professions. Lenin with his mantra of learn, 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 would fit well in these times where a similar mantra applies of change or be changed and continuous learning as a guide for a lifetime. Where did this passion to embrace change and continuous learning come from? When did it start? I can recall in my career being supervised to stay the course. No shocks, please, follow the rules. But the ethic of engineers was always been, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. World War II, some say, was won by good administrators. Do not break ranks, follow orders, top down. But something has happened. Maybe it was the value attributed to research and the disruptive impact of emerging technologies. Perhaps it was globalization, mass migration or the arrival of social media. Note the internet has served to sustain and even amplify change. In my experience, there was a moment during the recession in the early 80s when people no longer were saying, and how are you? in response to the personal greeting of, good morning, how are you? The new greeting was, I'm busy. Another recollection was that the revolution began even earlier in the mid 1970s, when a popular business management guru by the name of Peter Drucker proclaimed, if it ain't broke, break it. The theme of revolution was not, was theme of revolution, not evolution was embraced. Today we're exploring change management from three perspectives personal, organizational, and as a, practice, as a practice by the profession of change managers. As for a personal approach, we'll learn about change management from Claire Paulson of Better Leaders. He practices change management one-on-one -on -one through personal coaching. Claire, share us your perspective. Okay, so I thought that what I would do rather than, you know, is, is talk to you about uh, a program here that we use for change in companies uh, because it lays it out very well. And, and I believe that change is constant. You know, whatever you're doing in a company, you're doing it, it it's, it's change. You know, so the program I'm referring to is, is the uh, prioritized leader talks about how organizational change and progress depends on effective leadership. And the people in the organization are probably the most important part of the change factor in, the lead in leadership. And I'm going to go through sort of the priorities of leaders, of leadership. So the, the, the one that we'll go through first is, is purpose. When we know and knowing and living the why of the organization, being able to uh, be understand the clear and compelling future, being able to articulate the future, how, how the why relates to the changes you want to make in your organization. What is it that you have to do in order to make the changes in the organization, to look at the purpose of, of, of an organization and, and understand that purpose so that you can work towards a, a positive future. So you have to know, why are you changing? What will be the desired outcome of the change? Okay. So, and we need to look at the people in the organization. Think people over profits. That's hard to do sometimes when you're, when you're a company owner, company manager, to think people over profits. But if you think profits over people, then you abuse the people. If you think people over profits, the people will produce for you to create the profits that you want. And when you're putting the pe bringing the people on board, you have to consider more than just their resume. You have to consider more than just their having the right technical skill. Because how many of you, I'm sure a lot of you can think of people that you have hired over the years who had all the right resume, had a perfect resume, you hired them, then they really weren't capable of doing the job. 
So you need to have, they need to also have the right personal competencies, also known as soft skills. Uh, at one point, uh, you called the technical skills, the hard skills and the, and the other stuff, the soft skills, because we didn't know how to measure it. We figured out how to measure soft skills. And so now they've become personal competencies. So you, you need to understand that in order to be successful and move with the change in environment. How fast you go, fast or slow, is so important. I just, I just want to back up and do one more thing on the people. We, I, I had a client a number of years ago that we were working with, and uh, they had a department that they were phasing out. It was a technical department that they were phasing out. And they had about 10 people in there that were becoming redundant. And so they wanted to move them all into the customer service area. Now, this was a technical pro uh, department there wanting to move into the customer service. So we did some analysis of the people that they were moving out of there and attempted to fit them to existing jobs and uh, existing positions uh, without a lot of success, I must say, because it didn't take long to find out that these people that were uh, that were in a, um, a technical capacity really didn't have the people background to be able to uh, to uh, appropriately merge into the into the people side of things, and so. So we ended up with about half of these people not being suitable for the, for the job and being uh, terminated or, or some of them got moved into another department. So they really, you have to look at not only personal competencies and technical skill, but you have to look at everything in context when you're hiring people. How fast or how slow you need to move to be successful? How, how fast or how slow to capitalize on opportunities for change and preserve capital. I know of companies that I've gone into where, where pace was all important and they had people working extended hours. People were burnt out. They were doing sloppy work because it was get it done, not so much get it done right. And it was a real problem. It, also, I worked in companies where the pace was way too slow. And so the, the employees were showing disinterest. They, they were bored with their, with their job. They were in a rut. They didn't know where to go, didn't know how to get there, didn't really care. And so we needed to find, help them to find the right pace, do the right things at the right speed in the right order. And, that, and when we finally found that, we found that it, that it did sustain more long-term success and they felt much better and they got people that, were, that knew what they were doing and wanted to do it. Next thing we look at is perception, the plan for the future. Choose a growth mindset. Always be open to creative solutions, and new ideas. Think about change implementation. How are you going to implement change? What change is required? Have an open mind, have, a, have a, an innovative personality, an improvement-oriented perception, and move on. And profit, well, a lot of people think that profit should be number one in this, but uh, it's the result you get when you do everything else right. And being profitable, profitable fosters a, a, an owner mentality and working with the right mindset fosters that owner mentality and, and puts everything you are able to, to, to obtain that when you have a, a financial order to the organization. So the order of importance for successful income I don't see your, I can't see your hands here, but how many of you think that there's a different order than what I've, I put them in? So profit, you, you, you view profit as a byproduct of these other yeah. things. These you do other. everything else right, you get the profit and you, you realize the change. 
One of the big points going on in the market today is the emergence of this ESG, um, environmental respect, uh, social inclusion, uh, good gov corporate governance. It seems to me when you, if you want to push this people over profit too far, you end up saying the union should be running the company. Are unions people oriented? Oh, oh, this is good. This is our next webinar. <laughs> <laughs> now, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, we could take that further. Okay, well, I, I, I want to thank you, Claire. We'll uh, we'll have an opportunity for questions uh, further on. So, uh, without any further ado, we're exploring change management in this episode from three perspectives: personal, organizational, and as a profession. Coaching an entire organization to change is no small challenge. We'll learn more from Greg McGilvery of Scenarios to Strategy. He practices change management one to many, the what I'll call corporate coaching. Greg, share with us your perspective. Thanks, Perry, and thanks to the KEI Network and those who have taken time out today to uh, join us. People have spent uh, a lot of time making predictions about the future that turned out to be terribly wrong. Getting it right is important. General Sedgwick of the Union Army uh, making a unchallenging prediction of the future cost him his life. <laughs> so we look at change management. When we think about uh, the, the Wikipedia definition, it approaches to prepare, support, and help individuals, teams, and organizations in making organizational change. We don't use the term of change management in our practice, but clearly what we do fits in to that definition. We help organizations and stakeholder groups first understand external change, then adapt to it while also improving both internally and in response to change and ideally to work better with others. Worked with a, a vast array of clients through a number of sectors. And uh, as we think about change, it's good to reflect back on how we got here today. Change in the 21st century, the complexity of it is rooted in our systems. Since the dawn of time, our systems have grown up and expanded and become highly complex. Cities are a great example. Here in cities, we have food, water, mobility, transportation, waste, and many, many other systems. They are complex, they are interdependent. For example, imagine a healthcare system without the access to water or a food system without access to mobility. It's amazing to think that given these complex interdependent systems that most of our cities only have around 10 days of food supply that no one central body has planned for. Even in the face of a global pandemic, our complex systems have served us very well. Make things even a little bit more complicated is we have many stakeholders participating in these complicated systems. Each stakeholder may have some influence on the system and others, uh, yet no one know, owns or controls them. We have an array of individuals and formal groups, companies, government agencies, not-for-profits and multi-stakeholder groups. Let's add in some change, societal change, social change, economic change, technological change, and many, many, many other flavors of change that just adds a great deal. And, and along with systems, the array of stakeholders and change in and of itself adds tremendous com complexity. This, the collision of systems, complexity and change creates unprecedented uncertainty, leaving uh, us and many would argue that it's almost impossible for people to even come to understand these systems, let alone intervene to improve them. The solutions that we have to this complexity are three. Let's talk about the first, scenario planning. Scenar we know how complicated the world is, yet we must still act. Scenario planning 
structures, forces, factors, and actors in our business environment. And from that, we can start to talk about change. If you've ever been in a uh, pool of water, trying to get your arms around the water is virtually impossible. Uncertainty, uncertainty is a lot like that. Uncertainty, uncertainty like water is fluid and difficult to contain. Scenario planning, like an ice cube, structures that uncertainty. So your organization can pick it up and start to grasp it a little bit and at least start to talk about it. We have a very, uh, so what is a scenario? It's, it's, a, it's simply a story about the path from today to a future time horizon. We have a very straightforward process to develop scenarios. We start by defining a focal question in a relevant time frame. For example, how does our company grow looking out to 2030? Participants submit ideas around future changes that could shape the future in that conversation. Our participants then group all of those hundreds of future changes that are possible into a roster of typically 10 to 15 driving forces. From that, we consider collectively and in aggregate the relative importance and uncertainty of the driving forces. And we come up with and identify two what we call critical uncertainties to break out four distinctive futures. Good scenarios are plausible. They make sense. We're not talking about science fiction. They're often highly creative as the client group makes choices about how various futures could unfold. Because they're focused on that focal question, they're always relevant to the organization. And we like to think some of our scenarios can be quite challenging. We then bridge from scenarios on the left-hand side of the bridge, where we have our interviews, focal questions, driving forces, uncertainties, and stories, to the right, where we actually live those stories to surface strategic issues and potential responses, identify focus areas. Once you have focus areas, you can set some broad goals, outcomes, expressions of success, and then start to develop strategic initiatives comprised of actions, a little bit of measurement, renew your vision, mission, values, perhaps look at some contingent strategies, and you've got yourself the makings of a very robust strategy. The scenarios also can be used as a way of mining a roster of signposts that can serve as an early warning system as the future unfolds in front of you. You can also use scenarios as a bit of a wind tunnel to test strategic options. We've done some work uh, with a group of uh, 12 people working on some post pandemic futures, looking out to 2023 and beyond. We'd be happy to share some of that work with you. There's also a five forces shaping the post pandemic future article available on our website. Solution two, strategy. Our approach to strategy is equally straightforward. I wouldn't say it's necessarily simple, but in a way it is. We divide, identify and frame a set of elements that we manage across a continuum Again, looking out the window, scenarios is a great way to do that. Your e-scans to inform your strategy development. You then start the journey, implement your plans, and follow through. Larger organizations will embrace an annual planning cycle where we plan this year for next. Take stock of last year in Q1, engage our organization and their ideas in Q2, develop team and individual plans in Q3, and by the end of the year, have the board approve the plan with measures so that January 1 of the following year, the organization can get about the business of implementing its strategy and the cycle begins again. We also have two page plans, which establish clear accountability for each and every team and team member. And the broad imperatives of the two page plan are communicate, uh, the broad strategic imperatives of the organization show up on the left, the team's role in and purpose shows up on the left, 
And then an accountability roster shows up on the right, which a team leader can use, much like a to-do list, to manage the strategic goals of his or her team. Some attributes of the process. Rather than doing a strategic planning workshop and generating a report, which most consultants do, and they give it to the leader, and then the leader's got to try and find people to take the seats on that bus, we actually integrate the organization into our plans so we can take uh, pursue a pathway of engaging every single mind and getting better. We uh, take an all stakeholder perspective and building strategy and build a value and purpose driven culture as we do this work. So effectively 100% of what an organization is today and will become shows up in one place. It really defines who the organization is, why, why they exist, what they're getting after and how they're getting after it. Brand new area, uh, having done this work uh, at S2S for close to 20 years now, we've been pushed into asking some bigger questions. Back to questions around those complex systems we talked about that many of us can't even seem to get between our ears. We can't even seem to be aware of the vast array of stakeholders. And uh, so we've uh, been pursuing a brand new idea called a collaborative. A collaborative is a new form of organization. We've done a lot of homework, talked to a lot of organizations uh, that work in the collaborative space. Uh, Stanford University for one, Collective Impact, our friends down at Be Well Orange County in California, and they haven't seen anything quite like this. It's a new form of organization, much like during the Industrial Revolution, a body of people came to help out a sole proprietor to industrialize a body of people known as a corporation. As we've grown up in the last 200 years, we're talking about bringing a body of stakeholders to our complex systems, all of whom share a common purpose. It could be a really tough intractable problem like decarbonization. It could be a great opportunity like advancing, advancing innovation here in Alberta. The difference with our model is these collaboratives grow organically across a geography. We have very specific uh, IP we can share on how to build these. But the biggest thing is when people want to start to work together is not to encumber them with a bunch of process. We share three new ideas, one being this idea of a collaborative. We talk about the idea of organic collaboration and we talk about the attributes of collaborative leaders. Each of those pieces of IP are just two pages long. We then have a getting started session, which is described in another two pager to help the collaborative group focus on common purpose, shared values, and when, when they're ready, improvement options. Some improvement options include applying technology to help folks work better together in a digital environment, analytical technology where people can look at importance and performance, and, and, and get a sense as to how they're doing. We have some collaborative leadership infrastructure, a six module program that was designed for a large infrastructure project to get a number of First Nations on board. It could be applied to decarbonization, very simple take it and use it uh, kind of infrastructure there. And the strategic guts of a collaborative is something called theory of change. And we've done a bunch of homework, again, another two pager it's really the, telling the story of how a collaborative can improve, what they're focused on and what their theory is on solving a problem to create a story that people support and organizations support and they can check in on from time to time. Show you what a collaborative looks like. Again, this organic analogy is explained in some of our uh, reading materials. But what we're talking about is a collaborative is bound much like the cells in your body by some shared DNA. In this case, the shared DNA is the why of the collaborative, a shared purpose or mission. The who is the members, the how is shared values and ground rules. And when it comes down to the what, generally the best way to work collaboratively is talk about interests and then collaborate creatively on shared solutions. Let's park that DNA into the middle. Much like a cell, you've got subcells. 
And these are folks that you know, could be individuals with a passion that want to share, uh, have an interest in, in, the, in the common purpose of the collaborative. Another could show up as an informal group of citizens working on something that aligns. You can have companies, not-for-profits, and government agencies with their strategic plans that define who they are show up. And ultimately, you can have existing multi-stakeholder groups. The, the interesting part of this is there's no one strategic plan to bind everyone together. We've seen years of evidence where folks get uh, working together, they develop a strategy, the strategy becomes dated, people move on, and ultimately the collaborative effort uh, goes by the wayside. Keep in mind that 80% of strategy fails in implementation in a single organization setting. Let's uh, drill down a little bit more. We have our shared DNA. Let's talk about a few focus areas that we keep in mind to help govern our collaborative. The highest and greatest benefit that can be garnered in minutes by just signing up and joining a collaborative is becoming aware of others that share your purpose. How many times have you been around where you see two almost exact organizations pursuing the same purpose without knowing about each other? 100% inclusives welcome everyone in to build awareness. Awareness gives the option to communicate with others and ideally to collaborate, not the requirement, the option. Bring in a little bit of coordination, a little bit of technology, and you've got yourself a collaborative. Sounds easy. One collaborative, great, fantastic. Get it. We're all working together. We're aware of each other. We have a theory of change. We thrive as individuals. And because we all thrive as individuals, groups, organizations, multi-stakeholder groups, obviously the whole will thrive. Now, a few collaboratives is even better. Many collaboratives? Hmm, not sure we've solved the problem. How do we make sense of these? Each collaborative, again, self-organizes organically based on the choices of its members by a common purpose and by a common geography, whether that be a community, a municipality, it could be a regional collaboration, provincial, national, international, just to give some examples. Just as nature doesn't do anything without a purpose, and, and as we have individual collaboratives thriving organically, many can grow and thrive in the same way. How and where they thrive is 100% based on the choices of individuals, groups, organizations, and multi-stakeholder groups to contribute to where they think they can help. Many collaboratives thriving together. Any individual group, company, agency, nonprofit, or multi-stakeholder group can plug and play anywhere in the world. Collaboratives are the next evolution of human connection. The story is new, uh, just uh, unrolling this. In fact, this is the first time I've presented these ideas formally. So to uh, wrap up, really how we can help in the field of change management is to help folks understand change, to adapt to change externally, and to improve internally, and to work better work better together with others. Look forward to your thoughts and your comments. Superb, thank you, Greg, that, that was excellent. Uh, I do have a question on the chat. I'll ask Jeff Hewlett. Jeff, I don't know whether you've been unmuted. Would you uh, pose a question to, to Greg? Yeah, sure, hi, hi Perry. Uh, thanks, Greg, for that uh, presentation. And um, I think you touched on it more towards the latter part of your presentation, um, but at the beginning, you uh, shared some tools that you use within an organization to manage the process. And I know you talked about an, uh, a robust accountability framework once the kind of agreed upon direction has been established. Right. And I've seen this process unfold in several organizations in the past. And 
I wonder what you might say in terms of how do you uh, prevent this process from becoming a te technocratic exercise of record keeping and you know, performance management is obviously a part of this because you've got to track whether you're actually achieving what you set out to achieve. Um, but I've also seen it kind of devolve into this morass of record keeping and all of these um, targets that are established. And it be kind of, uh, kind of uh, smothers itself under its own weight. And so how do you keep the aspirational part of this alive without choking it out with all of the um, performance measurement and tracking that you need to do. So basically what you have is a two page plan. Again, communicate how many strategic plans wind up on the shelf in a yeah. season somewhere. So this two page plan allows, in fact, I'm talking to a client with 3000 employees and over 200 teams, and they're very interested in this approach. It's broad strategic imperatives. I call it the yellow because we don't use a robust performance management system. We use something called Excel. That yellow okay. section, the organization's why, its vision, mission, values, its focus areas, and its top-down priorities are in that. And those get communicated out to every single team. The ask from the team is to find your role in, in that broad plan that we've had approved by our board and give us your ideas and take it, what can you do to address those imperatives and what else can you do or do you think we should be doing to roll forward? This is where the magic of an annual planning cycle works. If you're trying to do that when everyone's busy doing their jobs today, that's, that, that becomes a morass. A little company called Suncor, I learned this annual planning cycle from, we were so focused on achieving the goals that we had on our laps by December 31st of last year, that you never talked about new goals. Everyone was busy executing. If you can get thousands of people executing on the plans they develop themselves, that's, and that's what happens as you develop the plan. So the, the, the two-page plan is a strategy development tool, an implementation tool, and a performance management tool. And it's no more cumbersome than a to-do list for a leader of a team. Keep in mind that the business of an organization has a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of roles doing a whole bunch of jobs. This is that little slice above that. So you see, thanks, Craig, very much. Uh, we are exploring change management in this episode from three perspectives, personal, organizational, and as a profession. I personally practiced change management as a consultant some years ago, often involving entire industries communities and professions. And I can recall one engagement. It wasn't, I was, it was one where I was uh, one of the consultants among many. And it was in Mexico City. And they had 20,000 people in a stadium participating with, the, with voting uh, capability. They had little electronic devices that they could vote yes, no, or maybe. And the facilitator was taking 20,000 people through a collaborative exercise in the future design of Mexico City. It was extraordinary. I'd never seen anything quite like it, but uh, we'll get back to that later, Greg. I'd, I'd like to know your views of whether you see electronics playing a role in helping build collaborative exercises that are more dynamic and taking advantage of these collaborative technologies, which we now have. Today, we're blessed, I think, I hope, by the formation of an association of change management professionals. Uh, I'd like to know more and hope you do too. So I've invited Axel Maus, the president of the newly formed Alberta chapter of change management professionals to join us. He practices change management himself, but we'd like to know more about the profession. Axel, please share with us your perspective. Awesome, thank you, Perry. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time, everyone, and the invitation to the the conversation. So thanks for the introduction, Perry. I'm going to go through uh, just a little bit of a level set on the definition of change management. And then we'll go through some certifications, some of the methodologies that are out there. And then, uh, you know, ask the question, does it matter? Um, and what methodology do you use? And I actually ask for your permission to participate in a question at the end in terms of what's the challenge of using something called Mentimeter. Uh, there's a code you can put in, you can get to it on any web-enabled device, your phone, laptop, whatnot. I would love to 
with the responses from this group and it's all anonymous and I'll share it as we go through. So in terms of change management, lots of defini definitions there. Um, put the one from ACMP up there, put the one from ProSci up there. Um, there's some different perspectives. You know, one way, one way to look at it is um, change is at times considered an external force that is imposed upon us versus a transition, which is what we do internally when we're walking through change. So there's some different perspectives there. You know, fundamentally, a lot of these talk to helping people move through whatever the change might be. That's just how it's defined from a couple of organizations. I'm just gonna put up some of the same change management certifications that are out there. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Some of the more popular ones, put ACMP at the top, not because they're the best, I just happen to be biased there. Um, but these are a lot of the recognized ones and there's diff different areas of focus depending on the certification. And some of you will likely have come across some of these in your work, I suspect already. So those are some of the certifications. Just, and then we're gonna muddy the waters a bit. And we're gonna look at some of the methodologies because they also have their own certifications based on the methodology. Um, so there's a difference between an association like ACMP, which is methodology agnostic, uh, versus ProSci, where it's a certification based on a specific uh, methodology, so the ADCAR. And I'm sure some of you have run across uh, that in your work as well. You know, is one better than the other? I would say no, um, fundamentally not. Um, it depends on what you're using it for and, and how you're using it. So, but you may have recognized some of these pictures in your travels as well as you work with companies. So again, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's certainly some of the more well-known methodologies that are out there in the environment today. So I'm just gonna talk about, you know, does it matter fundamentally? Um, I would suggest yes. If you're looking for a role in change management, you wanna make it past the resume screening, certification helps. Um, in terms of, you know, I'm going to speak to the Alberta market because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, certainly, when I went into the went into the industry, essentially getting ProSci was table stakes to get an interview. Every change management role, 99% of them all asked for ProSci, so that was part of my driver to get that certification initially. That that's what everybody was asking for. Um, the other thing is, if you want to practice globally, uh, you know, ProSci has some global recognition, ACMP does, McKinsey 7S model does, Cotter is recognized. So it depends on where you want to practice as well. Uh, certainly in the environment today, there's an opportunity, I think, to practice literally around the world while you're sitting at your desk. Um, so bear in mind where you want to practice because not all certifications are recognized globally, so, or some more than others. Um, and I think the other piece is, you know, are you looking to, are you looking to build change capacity as a consultant um, and go in and change manage a project? Or are you looking to develop change leadership capacity in the organization? And what is the organization looking for? Because depending on what they're looking for, the certification may make a difference there just depending on how they um, approach change. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some of the methodologies in terms of which one to use. Um, I'm gonna say the irony, so I've, I've got a couple of certifications and the irony in the organizations I've worked with is they're all methodology agnostic. They're, which is part of what I like about them, but they're all use what's best for the people in the organization and depending on where leadership is. And the reason I put this maturity model up here, I, I use the ProSci one, but part of it is understanding in order to use a methodology, understand where the organization, the leadership at, is that in terms of their, you know, we call it the maturity level and change. But if you're in an organization and they haven't had a lot of 
experience or support going through change of a one level two. What you'll see often is they'll hire, hire external consultants to come in, they parachute in, they do a great job, they use some methodology, and then they step back. But in the meantime, they ne haven't necessarily elevated the change of maturity level in the organization. Um, and what I find is in lower maturity organizations, usually it's a check-based, checkbox-based approach to change. And as you move up the curve, it's generally in focusing more on building leadership capacity and capability to actually lead the change. So again, depending on which, what they're looking for, some methodologies are focused on change leadership, some straddle both, and some are very much focused on the, you know, check the box, move on type, type approach. Um, something that doesn't change um, when you're implementing a change management methodology is the need for active and visible sponsorship. No matter what you do, no matter which methodology you use, that's a core, that's a key lever in terms of whether you're successful or not. Um, and I would, I would, you know, if you're looking to step into this space or, or you've stepped into it, I'm sure you've encountered this as well. You know, some of the, irrespective of which methodology and certification you have, some of the red flags that I would watch for when stepping into an engagement is, you know, are you, are you coming in at the middle or the end where they've already tried a whole bunch of stuff, it's not working, and now they're gonna bring in change management to save the day. So it's a bit of a red flag. It's high risk. If you feel confident, great, but that's, I feel that's high risk to take on in an organization. Um, and typically, if, if, you, if you're brought in later stages, you know, coming into an environment where people are change fatigued, they're already resisting, and it's, it's a bit of a, can be a bit of a slog. Um, one of the first organizations I stepped into in a change management role, uh, they were implementing a payroll system, they tried three times, and then they brought in a team of change management people. So I think half of our work was probably getting people back to a neutral state where they weren't skeptical and resistant uh, of what was coming down the pipe. So just some things to watch for as you step in, you know, you might step into a change management role. And again, I certainly wouldn't advocate of, of one certification over another. I know different organizations, um, and I believe WestJet still does, they subscribe to a specific methodology, it's fine, but that's what they're expecting when you walk in the door, or if you work with any of the big five consulting firms, they all have their own change management practice. They've taken best practices from change and made it their own. Again, they're all really similar. I don't think there's one that's necessarily better than the other as you move forward. So, and ask us to participate in a survey next. Again, it's anonymous, but would welcome your responses. And I think it's great um, with uh, Claire and Greg and their perspective. And so I'll ask you to think about that as you're answering this question. Based on your you know, personal and professional experiences, what do you see as some of the challenges with the practice of change management? There's no right or wrong answer here. Well, professionals, again, that's anonymous, but I am curious as to what you see some of the challenges. So if you go on your phone, laptop, whatever it is, if you go to menti.com and you enter that code in there, it will allow you to uh, enter your response. You want us to do that right now? Yeah, if you don't mind, if we can take like two or three minutes, Perry, that would be awesome. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Anyway, thank you. Institutional resistance working. So you got one awesome. in there anyway. <laughs> I got a, a few here. Got some lots of uncertainty coming up. Leadership buying. Anyway, I, it's just part of the reason I asked this. If you know, depending on who you talk to, their certification methodology, same conversation. The challenges are perceived as different. There's some similarities. All of these are spot on. I think. Um, 
but there's just different different perspectives and expectations on on what's involved there. So thank you for participating in that. I do appreciate that. Um, I'm just going to leave off with this. This is ACP. and p If you're interested, the website's there. You can see how what their approach to change is. Um, and I, I'll just share one other anecdote. I found out after I'd been hired in my current role that part of the reason they hired me was because of the certification I got through ACMP, and it was relatively new at the time. So it was, I guess, a pleasant surprise. But again, the organization itself is methodology agnostic. So use use whatever is best um, and what's going to work in that environment, depending on the change maturity level of the organization and its leaders. And with that, thank you. Uh, again, thanks for participating in the poll. Happy to share the results back, Perry. And uh, of course, welcome, welcome any questions. I'll just uh, stop sharing. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Axel, very much. And yeah, we definitely would like to see if you want to sum up the results for us. I'll do that. Today, we've explored change management from three perspectives, personal, organizational, and as a practice by the profession of change management. Change management as a practice has an objective to ensure orderly transitions guided by an ethic that thou shalt do no harm. This is clearly an ethic of evolution, not revolution, of continuous learning, which certainly is the challenge for the individual, the company, the organization, the state. And this, this, this is, I, I, I'll call this profound, where choice to change trumps command and control. Where no one, no person, no organization, no profession or community need be the victim of change. So if, if consulting does what it claims to do and does it well, <clears throat> then the organization, the individual impacted by change has the choice to participate or to resist. So when you ask, you know, what are the, what are the challenges facing uh, the management of change processes? The couple things that came to my mind personally were institutional resistance where they want to cling to power, which may be eroded as a product of the changes that are emerging. Or when you're facing an emergency where quick action is called for, where Russia unleashes what it might have on the border and quick action is called for and consultation is ridiculous. Or finally, where people have just gotten weary of change. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm thinking that that may well in fact be a factor that people just begin to bail out. Uh, I don't think our truckers are bailing out and we're seeing that right now as a, 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 a force to contend with that wishes to change regarding mandates as people have gotten weary or feel their supply chains are at risk. So there, there are many things going on in society at large at the individual organizational and even at the sovereign level and even international, which call about having a pretty good understanding of, of what change management is all about and, and how well to, to undertake it. Uh, most of us in these webinars and in the Western society are, are committed to and, and celebrate the, the democratic processes because they are very oriented toward engaging people in a process uh, as a prerequisite to making a decision. But under some circumstances, command and control is warranted. And therein lies the, the rub, is whether you're a leader in an organization, in, in a family, or in a nation, to determine when in fact command and control is mandatory for survival, or when in fact one can engage in a, in a learning process. So I'm gonna leave it at that. It's been a su superb session and I'll tell you one of my, my uh, metrics is why. We had 27 participants when we started the session. We have 28 right now. So we literally didn't lose one. So whatever you've done, Claire, whatever you've done, Greg, whatever you've done, Axel, uh, it was clearly engaging or everyone has already fallen asleep and doesn't know how to check out. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, we can now pose questions. So uh, I don't have anything sitting there in the chat line at hand. I know, uh, Valid, you had a question. Maybe you want to pose it to Greg. Are you unmuted? Everybody can unmute now, but please be respectful of background noise and all. Are you there, uh, Valid? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It was a great presentation. So the, the first presentation from Claire, I, <clears throat> he brought out the concept of the pace. So I wanted to kind of comment on the performance management system, the organization 
which have the right performance management system, I think they can adjust their pace precisely. So because they already have that performance, they know where they want to go. So uh, also there is a some good performance measurement system out there like balance scorecard. So I think using that can simplify and smooth the change management process because in that balance scorecard, we know different components, different perspective. We know that's where we want to make the changes. So I think with considering that types of the measuring tool, we can make the life of our employees easier. Thank you. Anybody want to add to that? Or I think you've made the point that performance management systems give us some guidance along the way. So we don't need to wait until a crisis emerges. We've got a, an ongoing monitor of the needs for change. Just to, just to follow up to that, that model that I used, there is a, a corresponding assessment that we can do with a company so that we can see where, what order their five priorities are in. <clears throat> so are they in the correct order or are they not? And often we'll find out that pace is near the top of it and uh, profit is at the top and people are at the bottom. And that bodes very badly for an organization mm -hmm. when, they're, when they're trying to grow and they're not treating their people right, they're overworking them, they're, they're pushing them to their limits. And so uh, we work with them to get them to reorganize their priorities so that they fit closer, fit the model so that they have the same or have a, a better handle on what they're doing and uh, are treating their people better and being more successful. Thank you. you know, one of the interesting things about change management and how prevalent it has become and the whole engagement process and consultation uh, again, when I first entered government, it seemed that, it, that my role as a public servant was to administer policy and make sure everybody stayed within the, within the regs. But then, in fact, innovation became the, the new word and entrepreneurs became acceptable. Uh, but I'll tell you, that there was a transition there in the organization where some of the leaders were clearly administrators who wanted absolutely no innovation and did not, did want, did not want deviation. Uh, did not want change and only wanted to hear good news. And I remember Stan Mansbridge, uh, who was Peter Mansbridge's father, was notorious uh, for wanting to hear good news. He, and he was a great manager, I mean, in the sense that he really embraced people and he made everyone feel that he was personally engaged with them and, and cared about what they cared about. But he didn't want to hear bad news. He expected that to be addressed and dealt with in the, uh, in the lower ranks. It's a different management style. He was liked very much. But uh, I, I think in today's world of rapid change, if you're not hearing what the bad news is at the front, at the front, it's going to gather up on you and, 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 and bite you on the ass. Distrust in institutions and to some extent distrust in professions, which are viewed to be all knowing and having the knowledge to be able to tell people what to do. It's, I call it a, a do it leadership model versus, versus a, a help model. Uh, when I was a consultant, and do, I remember taking, uh, I think it was Esso Imperial Oil to Banff for a weekend. And I really only had one message, and it was uh, articulated by asking everyone in the room, you know, what was the most powerful word in their language as a leader? And some people gave me a four-letter word back, and others talked about something regarding command and control. And I said, the, the, the strongest word in your vocab vocabulary as a leader is a four letter word called help, which is an engaging word. And it was one of the things that Eisenhower was well known for as a leader in, in a military sense, is th those are, that were winning the war with him felt that they were winning, winning the war with him, not for him. And that he was right there uh, along with him, a, a different model than Patton. Um, Patton was up front with the pistol and he'd put it to your head if you were a, a trooper who looked like you might have PDST, he didn't believe in it, but different leadership styles won different battles. Got a couple hands up there, Perry. Go ahead, let's see, I, I'm, I'm looking for him. Who's got, give me a hand. Randall and Peter. Okay, go ahead. Well, Peter go was ahead, first. Randall. Peter was you first. You I had think. your head up before me, go ahead. 
Right. Randall, go. Randall, okay. go ahead. All right, then I'll I'll start, uh, and maybe uh, for those who have heard me before, it sounds repetitive, but uh, due to network effects, the uh, pace of change is accelerating because there are like eight billion people, and I don't know how many technologies and so the com there's a combination of things going on uh and so uh at some point it will be unmanageable and uh the part i'm repeating is uh, the joseph tainter uh, hypothesis that civilizations die when they get too complex there's a diminishing return on investment or this economy of scale and it's going to take too much work to, uh, or energy to solve all of the problems that are generated. And uh, I think that we're going to have to face some kind of a major civilization-wide paradigm shift if we're going to be able to continue to manage and sustain our civilization as a whole. Well, there's certainly those that believe that the United Nations was, was going to be the answer, although the vetoes didn't seem to help. And then the World Economic Forum has stepped up and said it, it sees the future from an economic lens and uh, it will help us through to identify where we want to be next. And then you've got the Putins of this world who are more self-interested and say, I'll take care of myself first uh, and I'll, I'll rally my troops and you, you can whatever. But I believe yeah. that what's happening, though, is not just in our institutions, but in every individual, the, the critical path to managing and developing in our society is our, the size of our human brain, which was designed by nature to fit into a community of no more than 300 people. And the Who kind said of that? Who, where, where, wait, wait, wait. Where, where did that come from? That God had a number of 300 or biology? Yeah. Had a number. Yes, in fact, it's called a Dunbar number. And we were in nature uh, limited or constrained by the number of uh, resources we had at our disposal in a geographic area. Even if we're nomadic, uh, there's only so much game and food supply. So uh, we wouldn't have a population of more than 150 to 300 people. So our brains actually evolved for that kind of environment. And so, now we have artificially extended uh, way, way, way beyond that. And that's why we have so much depression today and frustration and anxiety and change fatigue. So the evolutionary process isn't sufficient in order to enable us, our brains to adapt. And mother nature didn't anticipate uh, this was gonna happen. And it was all because symbolic communication made it possible to build ever more complex uh, models of reality and uh, technologies. Uh, nature didn't so, anticipate that. So we, mankind through his technology has outstripped the evolutionary process. That's what's yeah. changed the last 200 years primarily. So, yeah. but if we could go back to becoming ants, we'd be okay. <laughs> or let our forest burn down to the ground and start again. <laughs> okay, we got another question out Peter. there. Peter. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for the conversation to start with. And i uh, sorry I couldn't join in early. Uh, for some reason, we had some links uh, problems here in the East getting into the call. Uh, You've but got a lot of links is, problems in the East, but go ahead. Uh, yes, indeed. Well, the truckers will be here uh, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I, I no, I heard they were stopped in North Bay. Told that the the weather is too bad to go to go any further. Well, actually, it just started fairly well. It's not a heavy snow, but there's a fairly large snowflakes, like big yeah. fat snowflakes falling right now, and it started yeah. since our call. Okay. We'll anyway, um, uh, so I don't forget my question. Right. Um, we were talking about uh, measuring performance, yeah. and so you have a plan and you've set out measurements or metrics. My question relates to when and how do you measure the performance and how do you aggregate measurements that are on different time scales because not everything's going to be on the same time scale even if you sample every five minutes uh, there will be events that are going to be at different intervals so how do you integrate all these things that make sense uh, just like a, a diagram would make sense as sort of Greg was presenting earlier uh, I, it's open to anyone in the panel thank you What I would offer, Peter, is we've all heard of KPIs, an organization 
has indicators that indicate performance. Top down, you uh, start to unpack those indicators down to a team, uh, division department, team level, individual level, where people have leverage on those indicators, i.e. individual performance drives performance, which gets measured. So many organizations have a bunch of KPIs and they have no idea how other people are even helping to achieve them. So but, but, that's but that, the, but what that's that the is, is that, that is choosing the right indicators. That's the, that's what you're doing there. You're choosing the right indicators. But my question is putting all of the indicators in motion. In other words, on a timeline. So when do you sample and how do you sample and how do you integrate, especially when the sampling might be at different time intervals? So the annual planning cycle would propose performance targets to a board. When you get into the current year, obviously your indicators are things that you can measure. Uh, what we did at Suncor and other clients is a monthly stewardship. Someone's got the job to aggregate those measures and show how we're doing this month, this quarter. And by the end of the year, I would actually have bonuses. I would in encourage clients to have bonuses paid out if certain indicators are achieved. Now you shouldn't have indicators that you're not able to measure. To, I hope that, that might be a simple answer. Uh, no, I understand. My, my, no, my question still is putting on a timeline. I mean, yes, you've got an annual plan. So let's accept that there's certain things that have to be done annually. But that's only one, that's only one point, right? A start point and an end point, if you like. When do you measure stuff in that, in that year? Is it, is it some stuff you measure daily, some stuff you measure hourly? Is it real-time measurements? Peter, Peter, I, think that, I think that depends on your company. And I think it depends on the priority of those things that you're measuring. So you measure the things that are most important and then it, you know, first, and then you move on to the support items for those things that are important. So you, you're not measuring things that that you're going to be doing later in the year. You You, you have a schedule for rolling out the changes and you measure the the actions as you go through the year I, claire claire makes the point uh, and a good one i think depending upon what your values are you will monitor what you value most more intensely and probably more frequently customer satisfaction for example in a monopoly is less relevant than cash flow but in, a, in an early stage startup cash flow may trump uh, it may not trump customer satisfaction if you're in the in the product design phase. So, Peter, I think it does depend upon your values. Uh, mm -hmm. It may also depend upon the structure of your plan itself on what you view as uh, key or uh, secondary. I don't know whether that answers the question or not. I want to come back to Randall well, a second. Well, actually, though, uh, Perry, that does put it on in a perspective because it gives one a, a, a context for why you're actually doing this. And it's yes. ba based on values. Yeah. So your yeah. values are going to be based on your sort of morals and ethical perspective yeah. of yeah. what it is you're trying to do. And I think Claire made that point very well. And it's sort of great when they said very early on, you've got to know your know yourself well and know what the values are of you and what your organization does value. Because values can change as cultures change and they can change under circumstances. What you may me be measuring today you may not want to be measuring next year. So you've got to even be measuring your measuring system and how effective it is in helping you achieve ends. Correct. So if I may, I don't wish to dominate, but just to summarize then the point here is, although Greg has given us, and that's where I stepped in, Greg has given us a methodology of going through things, but you also have to have these precursor things like knowing your values, yep. knowing exactly. your way of yep. communicating and all that kind uh, of stuff. Absolutely. also has to be in place. But he did touch on that when he talked about the process that he saw being relevant, is that early on, knowing thyself becomes a critical part of that planning process. Exactly. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I would use another word around values. I would say value creation or value generation. Those things that measure that generate value when realized and typically <laughs> creates value, which then gets shared with the shareholders and the employees. So this, this is very what interesting. Because because it, it, like the it, private it, sector organization. It, yeah. I want to get I want to get Brian Lee involved here. He's had his hand up for, Go ahead, for Brian. I'd like to tell us what you have to say, Brian. I'm not sure uh, how much I can add to this conversation. It's very stimulating and challenging. Um, 20 years ago, I used to do a program called Thriving on Change, and I abandoned all that uh, theory of change 
Um, so I want to take a slightly dissenting point of view here. Um, Mark Twain said, uh, I'm in favor of progress. It's change I don't like. You know, uh, <laughs> every, every, the other famous philosopher, Woody Allen, said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. So everybody wants this outcome, but how do you do it? So um, I want to go kind of two ideas that, you know, we work in healthcare, mostly in the United States, and what we're there to do is bring about change. And so what I've discovered over the years, and again, a, a kind of a contrary to what you're hearing here is, uh, I skip all those steps in process change and I go right to the front line. Uh, and so I believe the solution here is to go right to the front line and have them lead the charge. Uh, there's no other way to describe the impact and magical when peers listen to peers they admire and respect. And um, so, so then how do you get the front line to own it? Well, I'm not sure we ever teach leaders how to bring about change. And so I, I mentioned the, in the Mentimeter thing there that the key is to teach leaders how to gain a buy-in. Without it, all of this is theory. All of this is complex. All of this is lengthy. So uh, it's getting the buying, that's, that's all of it. And then my third observation is short-term change doesn't work. You've got to hardwire a culture change. And everybody likes to talk about culture change, but how do you do it? Well, for culture change, I like to say to work just fine, it must be led from the top. More importantly, it must be led from the front line. So I'm gonna go back to my, my harangue about uh, that if, if we go right to the front line, we can skip uh, all the steps of, of, of process change once you know what you want. Uh, finally, uh, my, my, my father-in-law in Winnipeg used to say, uh, people, uh, it wasn't, it actually was my father, it was Peter Senge, I didn't confuse it to you. Peter Sengi said people you don't confuse your, your father with Sengi? No, no, I'm, I'm confusing <laughs> some quotes here. Anyway, Peter Sengi once said people don't resist change. They resist being changed. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I'm in a relationship, and I know there's somebody out there that's trying to change me every day. Uh, but where she's successful, she lets it be my idea. So um, I think there's a lot to be said for, I want to go back to that point, that transformation needs to be led not just from the top, but it must be led from the front line. And that's too easy. Sometimes we want to make it hard, whereas it doesn't have to be hard if we go to the genius that exists within the front line. So that's my perspective. The genius that exists within the front line. I had an argument this week that the society should be changed so the intelligentsia is in power because they know. <laughs> But if they know, they're, well, they're at the top. That's the universities <laughs> running the communities. That's the universities where, quote, those in the know, in the sense they got their certificates, they may not yeah. know very much about people. They, they know, but they don't know how. Yeah. Well, we've got smartphones and smart cars. Maybe we need smart civilizations. <laughs> well, you know, the, the argument that Lenin laid out was that the intelligentsia will bring about the revolutions. And in fact, it only took the 12% of the brightest in the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution. They were all gone when the revolution was over. Yeah. They, they took their heads off pretty quickly. But the intelligentsia were the really smart ones that knew exactly what we needed in the future. I, 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 I'm guessing you're not serious. I, I'm guessing you're just just challenging us with some thoughts there because I doubt that you believe that. Well, you caught my tongue in my cheek, did you? <laughs> I think I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, it's it's scary because I think there is a, a, a we have come to overvalue knowledge without appreciating the relevance of knowledge when it comes to people's comfort and people's sense of engagement, and people's sense of respect. And when I entered into consulting, I, I was startled when my boss who lived in the private sector made a living in the market said, drop your PhD from your title, drop it from your business card. I'd spent years getting that, that, those three letters, but I did drop it and I came to understand why, but that, that did not sell in the market. My new business was to convince people that I could quote, help them, not do it to them. They didn't hire me to do it. Right. This, this wasn't brain surgery or, or surgery. This was, I was engaged to be a process person, like a teacher. And yet some of the most, the people most resistant to learning and to change I have found, and I'll be blunt, are teachers. And I remember doing some work on the development of community services for kids with disabilities. 
where we needed access to the classroom so the parents could raise the children in their home community instead of in institutions. And it was the teacher said, no. And I said, why? And they said, you don't have the right to ask, we're professionals. <laughs> and Jim Edwards was in the room at the time, he became treasurer in Canada, but uh, he was a, a radio commentator at that time. I don't know which way he leaned on that discussion, but uh, I, I found the most, the greatest resistance to change often comes about as a byproduct of appealing to, to professionals for help who are the know-it-alls and don't see it necessary to go engage community in a dialogue. And I think they then undermine the democratic processes that most businesses follow when they say, I, I need to listen to the market. My survival is based on listening to the market, not to my engineers that build the cars, but to the salesmen that sell them. Right. By the way, Randall, I, I put a little note up there. Um, I, I think you're right. Uh, I, will, I will accept the fact that we may, as a society, outstrip man's capacity to adapt as an individual, but we haven't yet abandoned our capacity to engage and build social structures in order to help us as individuals. We call them one-time families. We call them the church. We call them the state. And I think you're right. We, we may need to find a new social structure in order to help mankind through the changes that are facing. But I don't think man, man as an individual has reached the end of their evolution. I think we still have the option of finding social structures that will work. And maybe that social structure is the robot. Well, I'll throw out one piece there that I have some hope for, but it takes a lot of work. It ties into <laughs> physics uh, and uh, um, of reality. I, I'm, I'm starting to believe and also hope that there is actually uh, a, a fractal algorithm in the universe. We can figure that out, well, then we can figure out how to construct uh, effective artificial systems based on our own innate social nature. And that applies not only to the physical- Wait, wait time out. a fractal. You, you need to help the uneducated. Yeah, so these self-similar patterns, you see them in, in geometry where yeah. it's like self, it just repeats and repeats on all scales. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe that there are, uh, as an algorithm that uh, a fractal algorithm that explains the universe, <laughs> if you can figure that out, then- no, I can't. Okay. Yeah. No, it, well, it's it's some the, the pursuit of that is something like this: the pursuit of a unified field theory in physics. Oh. But uh, I'm looking at the the logic. Uh, you know, the world is binary, for example: on, off, true, false, yes, no, um, explore or exploit, avoid or um, approach. And, and I believe that in there somewhere is an algorithm we can tap into that will help guide us in forming uh, binary dyadic relationships, small group patterns that are uh, most efficient and effective uh, in larger groups and so on, scaling up, uh, but always keeping true to uh, the, the nature of complexity that uh, brings us all together uh, with our own personal uh, skills and the diversity of, of skills within the uh, population. I'm well, sorry. This is, this is, it's very helpful. Uh, if you could write some of this up for us, and we could probably have a webinar on, on uh, fractals and mankind's evolution and the institutions that are going to make it into the future and the role of algorithms in getting us there. So uh, Aditi, 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 have you been bitten this week? Aditi uh, has been home alone and, and frustrated and as a professional found it very difficult to be raising what an 18 month old who periodically bites her for the hell of it. So we were teaching her last week on how to uh, raise an 18 month old. I, I'm shifting gears here, but it's change management with your eight, 18 month old that we now want to discuss. Uh, how's your week been? It's It's been pretty hectic, actually. I used to complain before when I was doing my graduate work that I was busy. I was busy. I was really busy when I was running the company. Mm -hmm. But, oh, my God, nothing, nothing compares to this. This is by far the hardest job I've ever had. So your, su most... your supervisors at work never went around biting you. you you're saying that. Yeah, he's, he's the most difficult boss. <laughs> and I have read so many books on child development, uh -huh. and I still know nothing. Okay. <laughs> so uh, if that tells you well, anything. And every in fact, every new child to... will teach you new lessons. 
Look, I think there's a market there for change management in, in child rearing. Uh, in Sweden, your child must go, how old? 18 months? You'd be six months from being mandated by the state to have to go to a daycare. I would love to send him to the daycare. I'm just a little scared about this current condition. I cannot wait to send him to the daycare. <laughs> he has so much energy and uh -huh. right now we are still struggling with sleep so I'm enrolled in this course and my syllabus is quite thick so I'm reading that um, and yeah so I'm well, in immensely post in postmodernism you 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 will have been listened to that someone listened to the mothers that perhaps in the state said the command and control by the state will mandate to you that you have to send your child to daycare even at $10 an hour, we're on our way there. Um, it's a different state than I'm familiar with, but uh, maybe I now understand why that's popular. I, I understand that too. It's just uh -huh. if it wouldn't have been for the pandemic, I would have sent him away for like a good while back. Well, that, that topic, we only lost two uh, 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 attendees. I, I so, think you had your hand up, did you? Yeah. Who's that? Bud had his hand up. Go ahead, Bud. Bud, you've always got something rich to share. No. No? You're waving your hand. Wow. Well, okay. Well, uh, Peter has his up still. Go ahead, Peter. Yes, okay. Thank you. I Just going back to uh, Perry's comment, um, uh, sort of trying to summarize like a new kind of governance. Um, I would like to advocate that perhaps the new form of governance as we move through the remainder of this century will start to be dominated by cities. That cities will in fact become the nexus of much of the let the life of the world in the future with national I mean, cities and national governments are, are of course in the same territories in, in, in di different ways, but the, the national governments will look after hinterland and the cities will look after the economy basically. Wasn't that Jacobs, was it Jacobs that uh profess that the city-state was the future? Jane Jacobs? Yeah. Uh, well, I wouldn't say she professed it, but she certainly was a, an advocate for the city. Right. Yeah. But she also viewed in her last uh, her last book, uh, actually, was uh, Dark Ages Ahead, mm -hmm. was the name of the book. And it was, although she was optimistic, she saw that the future is going to be bumpy. And we are moving in that bumpy direction. And I think in governance context, a city is possibly the best form of governance. So, Someone was talking about, you know, a, a community of 300. Well, in a, in a human binding sense, cities are about as max organized as we get. And that's where you've got a bureaucracy and you've got a mayor who's really responsible. That's where the political, you know, the most political, responsible politicians in the world are probably mayors. Doesn't matter what ideology the country is run under. All city, all, all, all countries have cities. <laughs> they all have the same kind of things. Garbage, well, water, fire, uh, et cetera. So, so the, if the direction is downward to, to govern from uh, more localized uh, centers, then the initiatives of things like the United Nations and uh, World Economic Forum, et cetera, are going in the wrong direction. Well, it, one of the things I think has been an issue is that in the whole COPE process or COP process with respect to climate change, it's nation states that are governing uh, these meetings, that sit at these meetings. Yes, they'll consult with their industry associations and with urban uh, lobby groups, et cetera. But the people at the table are the are national representatives. And so I think in the future, we'll see where cities will be more at the table. I mean, there's many cities that are on the verge of having a population the size well, of Canada. I mean, let, let Ling should speak up about the size of some of the cities in China. Well, yes, I mean, I, I, lived, in, I lived in Shanghai when the, popula the population grew by 6 million people while I lived there. Yeah, well, there are some cities in China that are 45 million. Oh, yes. So I'm, hey, I'm not sure. That, that may not be governable anyway, but it is. I mean, the Chinese government may, may be the vehicle that Chinese, China has evolved into. If you look at the size of those rooms, when they bring their governors together, they've got a thousand people sitting in the room as the governors of, of that, uh, that country because it has such a large population. So per capita, I don't know what the representation is per capita. 
but in 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 this country, you would simply provide create more more MPs in order to give people more representation. But still, in in a federal system, uh, whether that federal system can hold is whether or not it appreciates the regional differences that exist in its between its borders. The U.S. deals with that with many more states than we have provinces in Canada. Well, it's it's past five thirty. Is there any? Departing question or comments that anyone wants to Wayne make. Wayne Clancy and Stephen Fanjoy have their uh, Stephen, you're, jump in. Stephen, and go ahead quickly. Um, well, <clears throat> I thought with uh, change management, most of the discussion would be around organizations, but we the Q and A has very interestingly gotten deep into uh, societal and even global governance. Uh, I thought Brian's comment, I think it was earlier about um, if you want to. Uh, understand how to respond to change and navigate change. You have to focus on the front line. And some of the other comments earlier about, you know, <clears throat> looking at the natural world, maybe for inspiration, because, you know, clearly, um, you know, over the 4 billion or so years of the earth, we've had lots of uh, adaptation of uh, life forms. Um, so there's something to be said for, bio uh, mimicry and, and learning from nature and nature is complex it's not reductive mm -hmm. um, nature is not hierarchical in a true sense um, in fact most species are very symbiotic and cooperative not only within their <clears throat> within their kind but very symbiotic and cooperative with others um, I think we do have a real challenge around governance. So, you know, the obvious example, the contrast is to look at China and think of what we think of Western um, uh, governance and, you know, Western society. Uh, I think what China is showing um, is that a, a highly authoritarian and hierarchical approach can work um, under certain circumstances, but it needs to have almost, you know, total power at the end of the day. Uh, and it needs a society that's prepared to be compliant to it. Um, and Stephen, Stephen, let me just halt you for a moment because I'm going to let you go on, but I want to point out something that you've just touched on. The, the social credit system in China is fundamental for control. I, mm -hmm. I understand that. Okay. So, um, but... Uh, the other thing that um, pretty much every living person in China has experienced during their entire lifetime, including older people, is that that model has actually, for the vast majority of their entire country, been good for everyone. So much like when people go to work at an employer, and we used to have people who worked at employers for life, most private organizations are authoritarian organizations. Mm -hmm. They're not democratic organizations. Most private organizations are not entirely um, rewarding merit. Um, and uh, the management and governance of most organizations is not always the brightest in the room or you know, the socially smartest in the room. Um, there is a great deal of randomness that goes to how uh, people get into positions of power in most organizations and in Western society, maybe probably in any society. So we have this notion of democracy as um, a distributed way of holding power to account. Um, we, we cling to it from a societal perspective. We objectively fight it or reject it in most careers. Um, you know, so most forms of employment, th those are not democratic unless you, unless you pretend that the market is democratic and that's a whole different argument. Um, I would suggest that if, because I, I believe in the organization of, in an organization society that I can't see in the autocratic model, but I think there's a real crisis in Western society that has to do with the way we um, allocate power. 
so like it's a myth that we live in a representative democracy. Very few of our representatives are accountable in any true way except once a year. And that's only if they're in power. You mean once every four no, years? Every four years. Yeah, sorry, every four years. Yeah. Um, but in truth, they're entirely beholden to the leader of their party. Um, their, their parties are private organizations that are highly hierarchical. We, you know, we think Canada is a democracy, but we basically have complete power during a governing period for organizations, private organizations that only get generally about a third of the votes. Hey, so, I, I need to be respectful of the fact that we told people that they might be able to join their loved ones at, at 530. Uh, but I'm going to throw a challenge out to you, Stephen, and to everyone that's still about. I mean, there's 21 of us still here. Um, Next week was supposed to be just a chat. Uh, we don't have a theme set up, but this one on change management seemed to galvanize a, a lot of people around governance. Uh, Steve, would you would you be interested in sending me a 250 word or 300 word editorial that I could use in the newsletter on Sunday? I mean, if I if I just captured what you had to say, it is I don't know is the recording still? Yeah, the recording still on. You can probably okay. shut it off now, Claire. But if you, if you or anyone else would be interested in putting together a brief editorial, uh, I am serious. I, I'd be prepared to, you know, to, 